Hello, welcome to an exciting episode of Geek Out with Perry, the first episode covering the new exchange. Over the past few years, we've seen big changes in the way people communicate and work with each other. There are a multitude of different types of devices, an explosion in the amount of information we all deal with, hardware changes, an increasing number of compliance requirements, and a shift towards cloud services. So let's talk to Perry about how we've evolved Exchange to help meet these challenges. Hi, Perry. Hi, Ann. So how has the architecture changed with the new Exchange? Well, uh, there's a fair number of changes in, in this release. Um, we've gotten a lot of experience running the service now, fairly large scale. Um, a lot of these changes are aimed at trying to simplify the system um, uh, up and down the stack. Um, Taking back at the, looking at sort of a classic 2010 deployment, um, starting at the top, uh, we have something that most people are going to have to deploy, which is called a layer seven load balancer. Okay. It's a fairly complex and expensive piece of equipment, hard to manage. Uh, and its job is to make sure that when requests come in, uh, they stay sticky to a particular CAS server. Okay. The reason you need to do that is because our CAS servers uh, have a bunch of business logic and session state that gets built up. And if you're constantly hopping between CAS servers, the experience will get choppy and the, uh, the, the cost from a performance perspective on rebuilding that session state for each request gets really high. Okay, And it affects both the amount of uh, processing that has to be done here and also the load on the back ends. So making sure this layer 7 load balancer understands enough of our application logic and looks at individual packets to make sure that they're going to the right place uh, and getting that all set up properly is complex and expensive. So that was one of the, the, the key things we really wanted to address in this release. Is to replace that layer seven load balancer with a layer four load balancer. Okay. And that just means that we're going from session affinity to TCP affinity. And okay. each, it only needs to worry about getting an individual request to one of the CAS servers that are in the array. Okay. All right. To do that, we need to really uh, take a look at what was the right things to put in a CAS server. And if you're only going to have requests come in uh, for a partic particular request stay sticky on that uh, CAS server and only do TCP affinity, you really can't afford to build up an awful lot of session state uh, on, those, on those boxes. So we split the CAS server logic and just restricted ourselves to the uh, auth proxy and redirect functions. You can sort of think of it as we have split this logic here, that, but now it is this CAS server that's going to do that session affinity work. Okay. okay. For us, that session affinity work gets a little easier because we moved the components that you're all familiar with. Um, yeah, the um, OA, uh, EWS, uh, POP, IMAP, protocols, all that deep logic associated with those things, mm -hmm. um, uh, back to uh, the mailbox server. So okay. all of that um, session state, mm -hmm. business logic, protocols, and protocols, the deep protocol handling and so on, all gets moved back to the mailbox server. And now um, uh, the CAS server just needs to do a, a look, uh, an Active Directory lookup to find out where the mailbox is okay. and go back to the mailbox server that um, you own. So if a request from you comes in, just does an AD lookup and finds out which server to go to. And then when we build up uh, a session here, we can only um, have a caching strategy that uh, maintains the data for a session. But because you're always going to come back to the same server, we can have caching strategies that last longer than that, okay. which uh, uh, gives us a, a big advantage uh, in terms of uh, long-term efficiency. Um, and then any requests at this level, this interface tends to be a little chattier. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, not having to do a network hop uh, makes uh, 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 it gives us a small performance improvement. Okay. Um, and then in this release, we actually did a uh, rewrite of the store to be a managed store. 
managed door process. And that gave us a few important wins. We still got uh, our core store engine. Okay. And we also uh, introduced Fast Technology as our content index engine. Okay. And the rewrite of the store, um, we got several big wins. One is uh, we got another 4x reduction in the I.O. per user operation. That's great. Um, so I'll, dry, I'll show that by showing a 4x reduction in the number of spindles you need to support it, uh, the number of users you'd normally have on the, on the mailbox server. Um, and then also the uh, logic in the store got a lot simpler because we have, over the last three releases, been moving business logic out of this store management layer mm -hmm. into our uh, business logic layers and creating a nice, well-tiered, well-structured uh, uh, service. All that's maintained. Um, we get the benefits of co-location in terms of caching and, uh, and those sorts of things. But uh, this, we now managed could remove an awful lot of the complexity of the store logic that had been there sort of as a, as a legacy thing. So this layer is now quite a bit simpler. And that's one of the reasons we got the, the I.O. improvements out of the system. Okay, so with Exchange 2007 and 2010, we had a lot more server roles. So wh right. what happened to them with this new release? Okay, so again, one of, the, one of the key goals here is to make the system look simpler, have fewer roles to manage. So um, you could always think of, uh, in 2010, you always had your um, SMTP sitting out here, maybe a, a, a SMTP a front end, and then a, a hub. Mm -hmm. And then you might have an edge SMTP out here, right? Yeah. Edge transport. OK. And the hub server would do the delivery as a remote system. You'd have to worry about uh, making sure that all these things play nicely with your load balancers and your firewalls and so on. Um, but uh, the analogy between an SMTP and a hub and uh, what was going on in terms of this business logic of something like EWS was pretty straightforward. So in this model, the SMTP front end is just part of the CAS array, mm -hmm. and every CAS server uh, contains that function. And then every mailbox server here is also basically also acts as a hub server. Okay. And again, the deliveries will largely be local for the hub server. So he's uh, uh, only going to have to worry about making deliver deliveries locally to the server. And then in the end, this unit uh, creates a nice unit of upgrade. Okay. Right? It tended to be that as this uh, business logic got complex, you get tight dependencies across the system. Well, then different servers, it created, you know, it's, not, it's sometimes a fairly complex dan upgrade dance. Mm -hmm. In this model, there's, this is a very simple, thin uh, server role, and uh, it is easily backwards compatible. And the complex interactions between versions is taken care of because we can upgrade this as a unit okay. across not just, uh, uh, you know, OWA, uh, EWS, and the hub, but also the UM role uh, follows the same pattern. So everything is a nice, straightforward pattern that you get used to. Um, you have a set of uh, a small number of CAD servers that get deployed, um, uh, roughly the same number of mailbox servers as you had. Uh, dramatically fewer uh, spindles that need to be managed. Um, so overall, uh, I think this is a, a significantly uh, simplified solution. So what about high availability in this new system? Okay, so uh, it's actually a key part of making this, uh, this work. In, uh, over the last couple of releases, we've been working a lot on our high availability story. And one of the interesting things we discovered was that we could get really good at uh, doing failovers and doing that very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, we ran into an issue, we could get a failover done in 30 seconds or less. Um, in principle, historically, one of the reasons for driving logic to this middle tier layer is this idea that because it's sort of stateless, um, you could manage it easier by taking these servers out of rotation fairly easily, right? Mm -hmm. If you manage to drop. But it did mean that you had this interesting uh, work to do to not only know that this that there was something wrong in the system, but also to make sure that the layer seven load balancer was aware and could take the thing out of rotation. We found that working across multiple vendors uh, and also doing the work to uh, understand that not 
not just from a availability perspective, but a quality of service perspective, that something uh, uh, that there was an issue at this layer was getting hard to do. Okay. And the, the model was becoming much more like the richness of what we're doing at, from our high availability uh, solution in terms of knowing it's time to do a failover or a restart at this layer. So by moving this down, it really drove us towards uh, uh, putting into the product something that we've been using in the service quite a bit, uh, which is called sort of managed availability, which is just a built-in monitoring system that, that is very good at looking at all the different components and being able to report on their health um, from an alert perspective, from a uh, artificial transaction perspective, um, so that you can actually measure the quality of service that's going on from a performance perspective or a failure perspective, and then take the appropriate uh, op uh, um, actions automatically, right? So there's uh, monitors that uh, are checking the behavior of the system, and then, uh, uh, then there's a set of actions that are going to happen based on those things, okay? And some of those are going to be restarting individual processes, mm -hmm. and some of them are going to be failing over individual databases to other servers, which will then make sure that the business logic for a particular mailbox also moves with it. And some of it is going to be failing over a whole server if we, if we suspect there's something uh, uh, deep about the OS or the hardware on this box that's driving uh, uh, poor performance or, um, uh, failures at uh, at this layer, this layer, or this layer. Okay. Um, having built that and uh, uh, used it in our service, we're getting very good at tuning down the noise mm -hmm. and getting very good at being able to uh, measure and react to a, a large list of uh, failure modes. Um, and then up here, the ability to detect uh, if something's going wrong is very simple. So being able to take these guys in and out is a very rare, or the need to is very rare, and the ability to detect it is pretty simple. So um, the managed availability stuff is really building on the uh, real-time experience we're getting running this in the service, uh, and getting that shipped as part of the product is pretty exciting. So you talked about synthetic transactions and probes. So what does this actually mean in high availability? Okay. So uh, if you're just detecting that uh, you know a database is offline, it's pretty straightforward. But if you've got you know, a large set of, what, protocols, um, and somebody's phone isn't working, mm -hmm. um, but everything else is working, you still want to d detect that. Or they're not just, uh, the phone's not working, but things are slow, mm -hmm. right? The, the requests coming through are slow. Uh, it's difficult to do that just from uh, taking a look at uh, alerts and errors that are being thrown. You really want to drive um, uh, uh, transactions that go through the entire stack okay. and uh, make sure that uh, the metrics that you're seeing on those transactions reflect what users care about, right? So not just is, do I get a response back, mm -hmm. but does the response come back uh, quickly enough and um, uh, and does it have the, the, the right content in it? Uh, some of this we measure directly through uh, performance counters that mm -hmm. we set thresholds, so that's part of the system. Um, but the goal here is, uh, uh, through managed availability, is to detect the, f the full quality of the service uh, okay. and then take the appropriate reactions automatically so that uh, uh, very, very rarely do you have to take the long time out for a human being to uh, come in and figure out what's going on and, and take the, the correct response. Okay, so it's not just about uptime, it's now about end user experience and true availability. Exactly. So that HA story is really great when we're talking about one site. What have we done in the new exchange if I am a an user and I want high availability, but I have multiple sites right. in my organization? Okay, so uh, one of the big advantages of moving to this, uh, to this model was it really enabled us to simplify the management of a single namespace for your deployment across your whole company across the entire world. Mm -hmm. um, for a large company that might have people that are working in multiple uh, continents, mm -hmm. um, you might have a world in which you have mailbox servers in Asia spread across, say, two different DCs mm -hmm. for high availability. These guys are a DAG. Okay, and in here, again, you've got uh, mailbox servers spread across 
multiple sites here. And in each of these sites, of course, you're going to have your own CAS array in both sites. Mm -hmm. Okay, so VIP1, VIP2, VIP3, VIP4. So a user who's normally working somewhere in North America, you know, wants to connect, they go through GeoDNS, says, okay, look, see you like you're in North America. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a random round robin between these two VIPs that have been published, and I'm going to point you to VIP2. Okay. And it's going to come back uh, uh, to the CAS server, and this CAS server is going to go back uh, to your mailbox server in the other site. Okay. Remember, this is very stateless. It's kind of a one-to-one -one proxy. Uh, so it doesn't really matter where this is in terms of how close it is to the mailbox server. But because this auth uh, process can terminate a bunch of round trips, mm -hmm. it's actually good to have this as close as possible to, the, to, this, to this person. So okay. if she flies to Asia mm -hmm. and does the request, She's actually going to get pointed to one of these two VIPs, even though her mailbox server is, again, back here in North America. Okay. So it's going to come through this CAS array. The, the initial loft is going to be very quick because it's close to her, and those round trips get short-circuited. And then she gets passed back to her mailbox okay. server back in North America. Okay. Um, so uh, it means that you take advantage of your CAS arrays across the entire world so that when people are moving around, they get a great experience, and as well, if you were to lose one of your DCs, mm -hmm. remember this VIP has gone away, but this is just part of the round robin. Mm -hmm. So she'll end up just going back to here. And as soon as the database failover should happen, remember we can do that yeah. very quickly, there will be the seamless transition to the failed over DCs. This will happen worldwide. Um, and then one final note, the single namespace can be maintained across version upgrades. So the upgrade story is, is pretty straightforward this time around. Oh, great. So we drastically simplified the whole namespace story. Yes. Thank you so much, Perry. Do you have an important question for Perry on the new exchange? Well, you have an opportunity to ask him. We're doing Geek Out with Perry live at Mech, so if you have a question, tweet us using the Ask Perry and Mech is Back hashtags, or send an email with your question. It might get answered by Perry at Mech. Thanks for watching.